Okay, hello everybody. So it is time for the next Physics 328 video. Um, what we did in the last video is we talked about Euler's equations of motion. And these were an equations of motion developed for an observer in the rotating frame. So a frame fixed to a rotating body and the coordinate system of the rotating body is aligned with the principal axes. So then we could say the angular momentum along the first principal axis would be equal to the moment of inertia about that axis or the rotational inertia I1 times uh, the component of the angular velocity along that first principal axis and so on. And so we had written down um, Euler's equations of motion and I've got them written on the screen here. So there's three equations, there are differential equations and there are three coupled differential equations. And so in general, that's not trivial to solve. Um, what we wanna do today is we'll consider a special case and see if we can make some progress on coming up with a solution to describe the behavior of that body. Um, and after we do that example, what we want to do is we want to see if we can relate the, the physical parameters, like say the angular velocity, omega, uh, to a fixed coordinate system. So how would an observer not attached to the rotating body, an observer outside of the rotating body in an inertial reference frame, how would they describe the motion of these types of objects? Okay, so first we're gonna do our special case example. And so the example that we're gonna do, there's really two things that are special about it. First it's gonna be a free rotation. And so a free rotation just means that all of the components of the torque are zero. So all of the left-hand side of our equations of motion are gonna vanish. Um, so we're gonna do free rotation of an object with a symmetry axis. And so a symmetry axis means that the object has an obvious symmetry where two of the principal axes are gonna have the same rotational inertia. Um, so an example would be a football or if you want a watermelon, something like that. And so what we'll do is we'll choose the symmetry axis to be the third principal axis. Um, and so this is the symmetry axis. And so our football looks something like this. Oh, sorry, I can do a better football than that. So it looks something like this, okay? And so there's gonna be a first principal axis, say in this direction, and then there's one coming out of the screen, which I'll try to indicate like so. And so this is the second principal axis. And so if you imagine if you have a football and you try to rotate it about this axis and then about this axis, then the moments of inertia or the rotational inertia about these axes would be the same. So we're gonna say that the rotational inertia about the first principal axis, I1, we'll just say that's equal to I, and that has to be the same for the second principal axis. For the symmetry axis, what we'll say is I3 is equal to IS, so S standing for symmetry. Okay, so the simplification is gonna come about because we're gonna set I1 equal to I2 and we'll just define that to be I. And you can see that if we go back to here, 
our general equations of motion, we have an I2 minus I1. And that's going to vanish. And that's where the simplification is really going to come into play. Okay, so in this case, the Euler equations of motion become okay so first of all the left hand sides are all going to be zero and so we'll have a zero is equal to what we'll have i1 is just going to be i and then omega 1 dot plus omega 2 omega 3 and then we have i s minus i so we get a i omega 1 dot plus omega 2 omega 3 and then is, I3 becomes IS, and then we had an I2, which becomes I. It looks, a similar, looks similar for the second one. We'll have a omega 2 dot, and then we'll have an omega 1, omega 3. Uh, and then the sign gets reversed as well, because we would have a I1 minus I3, which becomes an I minus IS. And it's the third one that becomes the simplest because the second term vanishes and we just get an is omega 3 dot is equal to zero. And so clearly if that's equal to zero, that means the omega 3 dot is, a, is zero or omega 3 is constant. So this last equation implies that omega-3 is equal to a constant. Okay, to move ahead, what we're going to do is we're going to define a quantity omega that's equal to omega-3 is minus i over i. And that's a constant because the rotational inertia are constants and we just said that omega-3 was going to be a constant and so what we have is a whole bunch of constants that we've defined into some omega. Okay, well that means omega-3 times is minus i is just equal to i omega. Uh, but I have an omega-3 is minus i over here. And so that's just going to be i omega. And then I have an omega-3. I don't have is minus i, but I have i minus is. So this is going to be minus i omega with our new definition. Okay. So... In this case, the first two Euler equations of motion become, uh, let's see, we'll have an I omega 1 dot, I omega 1 dot plus i omega 2 omega is equal to 0. And so we can divide by i both sides and we get that omega 1 dot plus omega 2 times omega is 0. Uh, the second equation is i omega 2 dot and then we have a minus i omega omega 1. So we have minus i, let's put omega 1 omega is equal to 0. Again, we divide by i, and we get that omega 2 dot minus omega 1 times omega is equal to 0. OK, what I want to do is I want to take the first equation and take a time derivative. Okay, so let's, we'll just write it in words then. Let's take 
a time derivative of the first equation. Okay, so we're going to get omega 1 double dot plus omega 2 dot times omega, which is a constant, is equal to 0. So therefore, omega 2 dot is going to be equal to minus uh, 1 over omega, and then it's omega 1 double dot. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take this expression for omega 2 dot and we'll put it into the second equation. And so that's going to be nice because then we're going to have a single differential equation uh, in terms of just a single variable, omega 1. And moreover, that differential equation is going to be one that we recognize. Um, and so let's see, when we make that substitution, we get minus 1 over omega, omega 1 double dot, minus omega 1 omega is equal to 0. Or, let's see, omega 1 double dot, maybe we take that to the other side to get rid of the minus sign, and then we multiply by omega is equal to minus omega squared omega 1. But this just looks like the harmonic oscillator differential equation. This looks like uh, something like x double dot is equal to minus k over m uh, x. And we know this is a harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator. And we know the solution to the harmonic oscillator x is equal to some amplitude um, times cosine of omega naught times t, where omega naught is equal to the square root of the coefficient of x. OK, so then in the same way, what we would say is, well, it must be that omega 1 is equal to some amplitude, which I'm going to call omega naught, not to be confused with the omega naught, which is the resonant frequency of the harmonic oscillator. Um, so this is just some amplitude, and it's an integration constant. So it's something we don't know the value of yet. Um, then it's the cosine, and then we take the square root of the coefficient of omega 1, which is just omega and times t. So this is omega 1. Uh, and then what we can do is we can try to figure out if we can solve for omega 2 using this equation. So omega 2 is going to be minus omega 1 dot over omega. So from omega 2 is minus 1 over omega, omega 1 dot. This would be minus 1 over omega. When we take the derivative of omega 1, we pick up an omega, and we have an omega naught out front. The cosine becomes a sine. But the cosine becomes actually, it actually becomes minus sine, right? So we get a negative sign. So this is omega 1 dot. So the minus signs go away, the omega goes away, and we get omega naught sine omega t. So we have our two solutions for omega 1 and omega 2, and we know that omega 3 is equal to a constant. Okay, so the total angular velocity vector is omega 1 uh, 
say I had uh, what do I want to do omega 1 e1 1 hat plus omega 2 e2 hat plus omega 3 e3 3 hat okay so omega 1 we said was omega naught cos omega t e1 hat and then we have omega naught sine omega t e2 hat and then we have a constant in the e3 hat direction okay so this is constant um so let's let's examine the plane made from the two first two principal axes first two principal axes So we have omega naught cos omega t e1 hat plus sine omega t e3 hat. But this just defines a circle of radius omega naught. Okay, so if we had omega 1 and omega 2 and then we drew a circle this is going to be let's see if I can do a little bit of a better circle So if we started at t equals 0 and then waited a time t later, then the angle that is going to be swept out is capital omega times t. The radius of this vector is omega naught, and the x component is omega naught cos omega t, and the y component is omega naught sine omega t. Okay, um, so let's try to draw this as a 3D picture. And what would it look like? So we're going to have the E3 hat axis, which was our symmetry axis. And then we've got our, let's say our E2 axis and our E1 axis. And so we know that in the 1, 2 plane, we have a circle. And then we've got our complete omega vector. Uh, and let's just remind ourselves that what we're going to have is a component omega 3 which is a constant is this red component and then this is a radius omega naught okay so I'm going to come back to this picture in a second let's suppose that omega is misaligned with the symmetry axis. By by an angle alpha. So this is alpha here. And so the size of alpha just depends on the relative sizes of omega 3 and of that radius omega naught in the E1, E2 plane. So if we define that angle alpha, then omega 3 becomes the magnitude of vector omega times the cosine of alpha. 
Okay, and so what we said is that we're going to have a circle in the 1, 2 plane. And as time moves along, the angle omega t will grow longer and longer and longer. And so the tip of this angular velocity vector is following this circular path and the entire omega vector sweeps out a cone. So omega sweeps out a cone and the frequency of revolution is this constant omega. And so remember, omega was defined to be omega 3 i symmetry minus i over i. But we've just written omega 3 as omega cos alpha. And so we could write this as omega i3 minus i over i times cosine of alpha. The language that is typically used is that the angular velocity omega is processing about the symmetry axis. So the angular velocity omega precesses about the E3 hat symmetry axis. The rate of procession is capital Omega. Okay, so that's a that's one solution to Euler's equations of motions. Again, it's a special case of uh, free rotation, so no torque on our body, and it's an object with a symmetry axis. Okay, so is there a relevant example that we could think of? Uh, the answer is yes, and Earth is that example. So Earth, usually people think of as spherical, but it's slightly oblonged. So is slightly, we'll say, oblate. It's non-spherical. Um, and so I want to exaggerate that just for the sake of drawing a picture. And so let's imagine that that was the Earth and so now our symmetry axis is along the long axis. So this is the E3 hat axis or the symmetry axis. Okay. Um, it also turns out that Earth rotates about an axis that is tilted with respect to the symmetry axis. So Earth also rotates about an axis that is slightly, just slightly tilted with respect to the symmetry axis. Okay, and so if we draw that, then we've got our omega vector here, and this is the angle alpha. And what happens is that omega vector traces out this cone that we were talking about. And the rate that it traces out that cone is given by this capital Omega. 
Okay, so for the Earth, this tilting of the angular velocity is alpha is around 0 0.2 seconds of arc. Okay, so one minute of arc is equal to 1 60th of a degree, and one second of arc is 1 60th of a minute of arc, which is so 1 60th of an arc minute, which is 1 over 3600 of a degree. Okay, so this angle then, 0 0.2 arc seconds is equal to 0 0.2 over 3600 of a degree, which is 5.6 times 10 to the minus 5 degrees, which in radians is 9.7 times 10 to the minus 7 radians. So it's a very small angle. Okay, so then we could say, well, what is this rate of precession? It's the difference between the moments of inertia about the symmetry axis and an axis perpendicular to the symmetry axis divided by I omega cos alpha. Okay, so alpha is so tiny, cos of a tiny number is just one. So this cosine just becomes a one. Um, the other thing that we need is we need to know this ratio of rotational inertia. If, if the Earth was perfectly spherical, then this ratio would be just one. It turns out that for Earth, it's something like 1.00327. So our omega is equal to omega s over i minus 1 times omega. And that i s over i is 1.00327. So when we subtract off 1, we get 0 0.00327 omega. So this is the rate of precession of omega about the symmetry axis, E3 hat. Um, and so let's just make, let's just emphasize the point that this is as observed by a person in the rotating frame as observed from rotating coordinate system. And so that's us. This is people on Earth. Uh, so omega is the rotational speed of the Earth, so it's 2 pi radians uh, per day. So omega is equal to 2 pi radians per day. Uh, and so that means if we take the rate of precession and convert it to a period, then we could calculate this period of the precession as 2 pi divided by omega, which is 2 pi divided by, what was it, 0 0.00327, 00327 times omega, but omega is 2 pi radians per day. So the 2 pi's cancel. And that's the period of this procession, which works out to be about 306 days. 
Okay, so that's how long it takes the rotation axis if it starts at a certain position at time t equals zero to process once around the symmetry axis and get back to its starting point. So uh, it's about, uh, well, it's, it's a fraction of a year. So what's 300 divided by 360? It's about five over six. So that's five sixths of a year. Okay, good. So that was the example. Um, the other thing that I wanted to set up in this video was our discussion about the Euler angles. And um, it's going to be convenient for us to first have a prelim preliminary uh, reminder about uh, rotation matrices. And so rotation matrix this is probably a review this is probably something that you've seen before um, so what we want to do is we want to convert from components of a vector in say an XY coordinate system to the components of the same vector in a rotated uh, rotated say x prime y prime coordinate system so as a picture let's imagine that we've got x and y and then we have some vector. This is our vector R, for example. Um, and when we extrapolate down to the x-axis, we have an x. And when we go down across, sorry, to the y-axis, we have some coordinate y. Um, and then there's a rotated coordinate system say x prime axis and perpendicular to that we've got a y prime axis and we'll say that this angle is theta okay so what we want to know are the x prime and y prime coordinates Well, the first thing we might do is we might take our x coordinate and see if we can go back to our x prime axis. So we make this a right angle. And so that means that this length here is the side adjacent to the angle theta. So this is x cos theta. OK, and then while we're at it, um, what we could do is we could say uh, over here we have x sine theta. OK, so let's see if we can do something similar for the y-axis. And so we have the y coordinate and what we're going to do is we're going to make a perpendicular with the y prime axis and what we would have here is this length would be equal to um, y cos theta because I didn't draw it but this angle here is also theta. And then we have also a y sine of theta. And so what I'm going to conjecture is that this y sine theta is the same as this distance. This is y sine theta. And so you could maybe go through a geometrical proof of that, but I'm not going to do that. 
right now. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this purple length x sine theta is the same as over here x sine theta. Okay, so if that's true, then what we expect is that the x prime coordinate, which is right here, is the x cos theta plus the y sine theta. So x prime is equal to x cos theta plus y sine theta. Um, and then y prime is, well, let's see, let's take this full y cosine theta here, y cos theta, and then subtract off the x sine theta. And then that just leaves us y prime. All right, if this is true, so if this is true, what we require is that, I mean, since r, whether or not, whether it's measured in the primed or unprimed system has to have the same length, we're going to require that x prime squared plus y prime squared equals x squared plus y squared. So let's check. Um, so x prime squared is x cos theta plus y sine theta, and then square it. And then y prime is y cos theta minus x sine theta squared. OK, and then we square this thing out. So we're going to get x squared cos squared theta plus y squared sine squared theta. Uh, plus 2xy cos theta sine theta. So that's expanding the square of the first term. And then we have a second term. I'm going to do x first. So we get x squared sine squared theta. And then we have y squared cos squared theta. And then we have our cross term, which is going to have a minus sign 2xy cos theta sine theta. Okay, so these are going to cancel. These ones will combine to give us just an x squared. And then these ones will combine to give us just a y squared. And so overall, what we get is an x squared plus y squared. And so that's what we wanted. We wanted the length of our vector to be the same, regardless of the coordinate system that we're working in. Okay. So this is our transformation equation. And so what I'm going to try to convince you of is that we could represent our transformation equation as a matrix. So we can represent the transformation equation as a matrix and what it looks like is um, x prime y prime is equal to uh, cos theta sine theta minus sine theta cos theta times x y so if you multiplied this out you would get x cos theta plus y sine theta and that's equal to x prime and that works and then we would get minus x sine theta plus y cos theta so minus x sine theta right and plus y cos theta okay good so that checks out uh, so we did this as if we had a 2D coordinate system, just an X and a Y. Uh, we can express in 3D 
if we're rotating about, say, the z-axis, so we take our xy coordinate system, rotate by theta about the z-axis, which is coming out of the screen, um, then what happens is nothing changes about the z component of our vector, say a position vector. So z and z prime, the rotated coordinate, are identical. Uh, so if we rotate about the z-axis by theta, then we could write x prime, y prime, z prime is equal to cos theta, sine theta, uh, minus sine theta, cos theta. So that's our original rotation matrix. But now what we want is a way to leave the z coordinate unchanged. And the way you do that is just to have a 1 in the 3, 3 position and then zeros everywhere else. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to call this r theta is our rotation matrix. Okay, so this is going to be useful for the next part of our discussion. And so that's going to be Euler's angles. So we're going to think about the rotation of a rigid body relative to a fixed or an inertial reference frame. Okay, so to describe the motion as seen by an observer outside the body, what we need to do is we need to specify how the orientation orientation um, of the body evolves with time with respect to our inertial coordinate system. What we're going to do is we're going to use the angles phi, theta, and psi to relate the direction of the principal axes. to the fixed coordinate system. And so I'm going to call the fixed coordinate system a prime system, say x prime, y prime, z prime. Okay. Um, so the idea here is that we've worked out equations of motion uh, in terms of the principal axes, which made the relationships, say, for angular momentum simple. Um, so then if we could relate the principal axes to the fixed coordinate system, maybe we could do something. Uh, so these angles, phi, theta, and psi, are called Euler's angles. Okay. So as a starting point, what we're going to do is we're going to consider the case in which 
the principal axes, which we'll label 1, 2, and 3, are initially misaligned with the fixed coordinate system, which again is x prime, y prime, z prime. All right, and so what we might consider doing is let's draw our primed coordinate system. So x prime, y prime, and z prime. And so let's say that our principal axes are arbitrarily rotated with respect to this fixed coordinate system. Um, well, to align them, we have to take, say, three coordinates x, y, z and modify all three of them to get to get the alignment properly done and one way to do that is to do three consecutive rotations so we need to align three coordinates so we can do this with three rotations. Um, so the first rotation that we're going to consider is a rotation about the Z prime axis. And so we're going to say that we're going to rotate about the Z prime axis through angle phi. And so this is the first rotation of the fixed coordinate system. And we're going to say that that's going to take our x prime axis to x double prime and our y prime axis to y double prime. Um, we could associate a angular velocity with that rotation. And since we imagined, say, a counterclockwise rotation about z prime, we would say that we would have, by the right-hand rule, we curl our fingers about the z prime axis and our thumb points up and so this would be the direction of phi dots the angular velocity associated with this rotation so we could say that this rotation through phi happens in a time t and so phi dot is phi divided by t okay so the first thing we do is we rotate by an angle phi about the z prime axis. I'm going to try to do something here. I'm going to try to insert a picture into this little uh, whiteboard thing that I'm using. And so this is figure 11-9 from your textbook. And so let's see how this works. So I think this is the one that we want. And so I'm going to expand the size of this thing a little bit. And so let's say this is figure 11-9. Uh, OK, so in this figure, this rotation about the z axis, the z prime axis, in the book they said z prime is the third co component of say some vector x so x3 prime is z prime okay and then they're rotating by angle phi uh, about the z prime axis and so that's what we tried to indicate in our drawing all right so that's fine i'm probably going to come back to that picture in a second maybe multiple times so in terms of our rotation matrices that we developed, we could say a rotation by phi about a z-axis is, oh, rotation by phi about a z-axis is cos phi uh, sine of phi 0 minus sine phi uh, cos phi 0, 0, 0, 1. 
And what we would say is that our r double prime column vector, which would be x double prime, y double prime, z double prime, is equal to our rotation matrix times the original coordinate system, which was a primed system. Okay, so good. All right, next, the rotation that we choose is to rotate about the x double prime axis by theta. Okay, so we could just immediately write down what that rotation axis would look like. Because we're rotating about an x-axis, we want to preserve that x-axis. And so the first entries of our rotation matrices are like so. And then there's a rotation in the uh, yz plane. And this is going to be a rotation by angle theta. And what we would say is that, let's say we take our double prime coordinate system and rotate it into a triple prime coordinate system. So that would be described by our double prime acted on by rotation matrix R theta. But our double prime is R phi, R prime. So this is equal to R theta r phi r prime okay let's go back to this picture here and so the rotation that we're discussing now is a rotation about the x-axis through angle theta like so and so what it does is it takes the plane that was horizontal and tilts that plane up like this. Okay. All right. Good. Um, we said when we were rotating about the Z prime axis that phi dot was along the Z, Z prime axis. Well, theta dot is going to be along the X double prime axis. Okay. And to do the third rotation, let's just make a note of that. Um, theta dot vector is in the direction of x double prime. Okay, finally, we're gonna rotate about the z triple prime axis by angle psi. Um, these are the, this is the way that Euler imagined doing it. You don't have to do it with this exact sequence of rotations, but it's the conventional one that we're going to, to use. And so the third rotation matrix, this is now again about a Z axis. And so this third rotation matrix looks similar to the first one we just are changing the angle from a phi to a psi. Okay, and then what we would say is that uh, we would end up with, we're going to rotate the triple prime coordinate system and the third rotation aligns it with the principal axes of the body which we're gonna call the unprime system. And so this is R psi, R triple prime. So the third rotation takes the triple prime coordinate system to the principal axes of the rotating body. We call the body coordinate system 
the unprimed system. And so that might be, say, just a X, Y, Z system. OK, um, but our triple prime was equal to r theta, r phi, r prime. And so now what we have is a relationship between the body coordinates. These are the body coordinates to the fixed coordinates. And they're related by this product of rotation matrices. To see a picture of what this looks like, we go back to this figure from the textbook. And this third rotation was about the uh, Z triple prime axis. And it was a rotation by angle phi. OK, good. So our complete rotation matrix Uh, complete rotation matrix is, let's see, R psi, R theta, R phi, and so we get cos phi, sine of phi, zero, minus sine phi, cos phi zero 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 one and we're gonna get one zero zero uh, zero cos theta minus sine theta zero sine theta cos theta let's see can I squeeze this thing in cos phi sine phi zero uh, minus sine phi cos phi zero 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 one okay and um, I'm gonna leave it to you to do this matrix multiplication if you do that what you should end up with is the following so cos psi cos phi minus cos theta sine phi sine psi. So that's that's the one one element. And let me put in a dashed line just to indicate where these elements break off. Cos psi sine phi plus cos theta cos phi sine psi. And then we have sine theta sine of psi. Okay, and completing this sine phi psi cos phi minus cos theta sine phi cos psi. And then we have minus sine psi cos. Ah, sorry, sine phi plus cos theta cos phi cos psi sine theta cos psi sine theta sine phi and minus sine theta cos phi and cos theta. Okay, so there it is. That's the complete rotation matrix in all its gory detail. Um, so let's just summarize that these different angular velocities, phi dot, was 
along the z prime axis and this is the z axis remember the prime system was our fixed system so z axis in the fixed or inertial coordinate system and then uh, theta dot was along what they call the line of nodes so if we go back and look at this picture we said initially that theta dot was along the x double prime axis that's equivalent to what they labeled as the line of nodes okay so let's not worry much about what that means at the moment we may revisit that at a later time and then the last rotation had an angular velocity that was along the z-axis and so this is the z-axis in the unprimed system which is the rotating rotating coordinate system okay so the complete angular velocity is just the vector sum of the angular velocities associated with each of the sequential rotations. So really what we're imagining is if we have our fixed system not aligned with the principal axes of the rotating body, what rotations do I have to go through? And what rotations do I have to maintain? What angular velocities do I have to maintain in order to keep the alignment uh, in sync? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to try to find the components of uh, phi dot, theta dot, and psi dot in terms of the principal axes directions. And so this is the body system, the body coordinate system, or the unprimed coordinates. Okay, so to do this, I'm going to try and insert another picture. And this other picture is the one that has just the last. Let's see, I'm going to try to make this big. So this is this has all rotations uh, in place. And so Let's start with the first rotation, the phi dot. It's actually the one that's the hardest. So if we can get through this one, then we'll be in good position. So let's suppose that this is phi dot. And then here we have angle theta. So that means that we have right here is phi dot cos theta. All right, and so that's along the third axis, x3, which is equivalent to our z-axis. So that means the, uh, and if that's the principal axis, e3 hat in that direction, then the, the component of phi dot along the third principal axis is just phi dot cos theta. Okay, so one of the things that we can state is that, let's put it over here. I'm going to put phi dot along the third principal axis is phi dot cos theta. Okay, good. Um, okay, so that means the component that is opposite 
is the phi dot sine theta component. And uh, that takes us to the y triple prime axis, which is not the one we want. We just want the y axis, which is in the direction of the second principal axis. And so if this is angle psi here, then this is the side that is adjacent to that angle. And so what we have is phi dot sine theta, and then it's cos psi. Okay, and that's the y component. And so the y component should be sine theta cos psi. So we have the y component are the, along the second principal axis. We have sine theta cos psi. Okay, and then what we need is the side opposite. Here is the x-axis. So this is the x-axis or the first principal axis. And this is the side that is opposite of the angle psi. So over here, what we have is phi dot sine theta sine phi. Uh, psi, sorry. Okay, so it's sine and sine. And so that means what we've got is the component along the first principal axis is sine theta sine of psi. Okay, so that's the first one. Um, instead of trying to draw more on this picture, I'm going to insert the picture again and let's try the theta coordinate. So actually I like this part of the video uh, the video lectures is because this is not something that would be easy to do on a real whiteboard. So this is actually an advantage. Okay. So the next one we're going to think about is theta or theta dot. And so let's put theta dot in this direction. And the first thing we see is that we can go to the x1 axis or the x axis in the body system, which is the first principal axis. And this is just, uh, sorry, I should have, this is supposed to be theta dot. This is Oh, I did it again, theta dot, theta dot. So this is theta dot, and it's the angle adjacent to psi, so it's cos psi. Okay, and then over here, we've got our y-axis. So this is our y-axis, or the E2, the second principal axis. And we've got a component, which is theta dot sine of psi, that points in the negative of direction of our E2 axis. And so summarizing all of that, then we would say, let's see, um, theta dot 1 is equal to theta dot cos psi and theta dot 2 is equal to minus theta dot sine of psi and this this theta dot is exactly inside of this um, x1, x2, or xy plane. And so that means that it is perpendicular to the z-axis, or the e3-axis. And so that means 
that there is no component in the z direction. Okay, we only have one more to do. And it's actually the easiest of all of them. We're just going to look for psi dot, but psi dot is, oh, sorry. Psi dot is already along one of the principal axes. This is our z axis or our e3 axis. And so that one's simple. It has no component along the first principal axis and it has no component along the second principal axis. It's entirely along the third principal axis. So collecting everything together, omega 1 is going to be equal to phi 1 dot plus uh, theta 1 dot plus phi 1 dot. And so we just look at all the first components. So we get sine theta, sine psi. So we get uh, phi dot sine theta sine psi. And then we have a theta dot cos psi. And then the second component is just the second component of all of these things. So what do we get? Sine theta cos phi. And the second component was minus theta dot psi sine of psi. And then finally, the third component. So we had a, a phi dot cos theta, phi dot cos theta. The theta dot was entirely in the principal axis planes of E1 and E2. So it had no components along the third principal axis. And then we have a plus psi dot which was entirely along that third axis. And so this is the angular velocity expressed in terms of uh, components along the principal axes. So this is angular velocity in terms of the Euler angles and components along the principal axes. Okay, good, so that's where we'll stop. And next time, what we'll see is if we can make progress on solving problems and interpreting uh, the motion of rotating bodies uh, from the perspective of someone in a fixed or inertial reference frame. All right, perfect. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you next time.